Good morning. We are going to get started. Thank you for your attendance. Welcome to the Fall Institute for the ABC UBI Initiative. We are really excited um, to be all here uh, this fall. We are together two times a year, fall and spring. So welcome to the Fall Institute. We're really excited about um, the day we have planned. My name is Heidi Matthew Mucha. Um, I am one of the state team members for the ABC UBI state team. Um, if you get emails or um, letters, they typically come from me, so you can put a name with a face. I'm the person that usually you contact. Um, I want to just go over a few things before I introduce our speaker. Everyone should have a packet, and in your packet you have an agenda for the day, information about cactus credits, and the handouts for our keynote presentation. So the yellow paper is the agenda for the day, and I just have one change. Um, during the sessions, the breakout sessions, Glenn and Amy's session called Behavior Basics, um, that room is just the Deer Valley room. It's not Snowbird and Deer Valley. So that room's just Deer Valley. If you want to make that change, their session is each of the three um, times. So just Deer Valley on that room. So I encourage you in the break or um, just as, as we're kind of getting started to glance through those um, sessions. You have three opportunities for breakouts today. Many of the sessions are repeated, but not every session is offered every time. So you may want to be planful um, at what sessions you would like to attend. You'll notice one of these sessions is team time and that's here in the ballroom. What that means is you will stay here and process as a team um, the things we, you've heard from Dr. Scott from one of the other sessions, but that's just your opportunity to work as a team here in this room. So for that hour and 15 minutes, you would not rotate if you choose to do team time during that session. I also ask that as you go to the sessions, if the session is full, select another session. There's plenty of opportunities to get the information today. Um, we want to try to even it out a bit. Each room is set up for about 100, just over 100. So there's a lot of opportunity to get the great information. But um, just if, if it's full, find another session and then mark that as a priority for the next opportunity. <clears throat> So we will have our keynote this morning, a break, and then our first um, session. We'll then have lunch back in this room. Following that, we'll have two more opportunities for breakouts, breakout session two and breakout session three. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me or anyone at the um, sign-in desk if you have questions about that. So that's our agenda for the day. We're really excited about that. Um, the next paper on the top, it says USOE or cactus credits. I've had a lot of questions um, the past couple of weeks specifically about cactus credits. So you can read through this. I'm not going to read through it, but just so you know, you are eligible for five USOE credits um, because you are a part of the ABC UBI team. But it's not automatic. It means you have to attend the institutes, attend your team meetings, and follow up with the tasks that you have at your team meetings. The cactus credits are awarded at the end of the year in June, but you have to register for the course. It's not automatic. So you've registered for this event, which is great. You'll register for the spring event and then attend all of the other activities, but you have to register. In addition to these events, you have to register for the course. You need to view it kind of like a college course. You need to register for the class to actually get credit, okay? And the on-track system at the state office um, is the system that we're using to award those credits. So read that paper, feel free to email me or call me if you have questions about that, but you will not see the credit on your transcript um, until they're awarded in June. We have to make sure that you attend and follow up with the um, expectations before we give the credit. So that is cactus credit. You can sign up for cactus credit anytime throughout the year. I typically close it the first of June and then I look and see to make sure that you've completed the requirements. So again, you're welcome to email me with questions, but those are the steps for cactus credit. <clears throat> the last thing in your packet is the handout for the keynote. And as you attend the breakout sessions, you'll get the materials when you attend the session. 
So don't worry about that. Now that we have those things out of the way, um, I am going to introduce our keynote speaker and he's also doing one of our breakout sessions. Or a couple of our breakout sessions actually. We are really excited to have Dr. Terry Scott here with us again today. Um, Dr. Scott has been consulting with us for a number of years and we are always so excited when he um, is able to come and work with us in our state. Um, Dr. Scott is from the University of Louisville. He's in the Department of Teaching and Learning. Some of his areas of emphasis include classroom management, applied behavior analysis, school-wide discipline, and extreme behavior problems. Um, he's author of numerous articles and books, and we're very excited to have him um, with us today. It looks like we're gonna set up maybe a, one more table. Is that, are we setting up another table? Okay, so I'm actually gonna have him wait for just a second so it's not so distracting, if that's okay. <laughs> and then uh, we will get started. So I am going to turn the time over to Dr. Terry Scott. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for crowding in here. Um, it seems like I'm here a lot, um, which always makes me nervous that I'm saying the exact same thing and people are annoyed that they have to come hear me say the same thing. However, I don't think we've talked a lot about FBA when I've been here, so this is a little bit different. And normally if I'm talking about FBA or functional behavior assessment for kids with challenging behaviors, I, I'm not doing it to this large a group. It's normally a training for people that are in a school working with a kid or set of kids with problems. So what I'd like to do with our brief time this morning is a couple of things. Number one, I want to give you a definition and way of thinking about FBA that anybody who works in a school would understand. I don't think we've done that very well uh, in our field in the past. So a simple understanding of what it means, what it is. Second, I want to try to simplify the way we do it. And the way I think of this is this. If you've got a student in your classroom or in your school who hasn't responded to what we do school-wide, doesn't respond to the fact that we have rules and we've taught them and we've reminded them and we've encouraged them and we've enforced them and we've set up arrangements to make it happen and yet here's a kid that still has problems. What's the simplest possible thing you could do at that point for that kid? That's the way I want to talk about FBA. So I think there's a really formal FBA and I think there's a really simple FBA and I think there's a continuum of FBAs I want to talk about simplicity. So I want to say right from the get-go, what I'm talking about today will not be enough for some kids. But if we're approaching this using this logic of PBIS, if we're approaching it using this logic, let's say that what we're going to be doing today starts right around that yellow-green border. Now, I guess somebody could, could ask, does it start right before the yellow-green border or right after it? I don't know. I don't think it really matters. What I think we're asking is, is there a kid that we feel like isn't being as successful as they should be given that we've got good universals in place? If that's the case, then I would say we need to do something different for that kid. What we do for that kid depends upon what's going on with that kid. I think a lot of times we've thought in this PBS system, well, you only need to worry about function when you get up into the top part of the triangle. You only need to worry about why a kid's doing that when you get way up there. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense. However, I don't think you can worry a whole ton about function way down. So what we've got to do is we've got to say, what's the simplest set of things that are kind of like FBA that would make this kid successful. And if those don't work, then we're gonna have to step up. So I want you to think about FBA as occurring throughout our triangle. In fact, 
I think all we're doing when we move to FBA is changing slightly the logic we've been using. So I think you're doing positive behavior interventions and supports, or RTI for that matter, if you're doing these four things. One, can you predict for me when the kids in your school will have a problem? If I said this to you, we're talking about behaviors. I'm coming to your school tomorrow. I'm going to be there for five minutes. If I see a problem behavior, everyone in your school gets $1,000. When would you have me come? Where would you have me stand? What would you have me looking for? And I know you all know this. You're all saying, 1207 in the cafeteria, standing at the east end looking south, these three kids doing this. All right, there's your predictor. You could do the same thing for RTI, for math. Tell me when a third grader in your school is likely to have a problem in math. What would that problem be? And someone's going to say, well, it would be fractions with this. Whatever it is, if you can predict it, then you can go to box two. What's the simplest thing you could possibly do? So let me restate my question to you. I'm coming to your school tomorrow. I'm going to be there at 1207. I will be at the east end of your cafeteria looking south at these three kids. If they don't do that thing you say they normally do, you get $2,000. What are you going to do? That's box two. Okay. What's the simplest thing you could do to prevent a predictable problem? Box three is, if you're really going to make that work, you've got to do it more than one day. How will you make this work across everybody in your school and happen all the time? And box four is, how do we know if that worked? Well, I'm going to come in and look, and if I don't see it, you get the, the $2,000, but I'm really not coming to your school, and I'm really not giving anybody any money. So you're going to have to figure out a way to evaluate that. So let's say we do that for your whole school, and we take great data on which kids are doing well and which kids aren't. And at the end down here in box four, we'd say, hey, look, there's 16% of our kids that still seem to be having problems. What should we do with them? What I would do is I'd pull out that 16% and I'd go back to box one. And I'd say, when, where, what, and why with that group of kids? So now I'm asking, for this group of kids, what's predictable? When do they have their problems? Where do they have their problems? What's going on with them? Why do we think that's going on? It's the same question we asked about your school. Now we're just asking it about a smaller group. And maybe we'll say, well, for this 5%, it's this. And for this 2%, it's this. What that allows us to do is to do two or three things for groups of kids in box two and do it consistently, box three, and evaluate who that worked for. If it isn't working for them, then we go, hey, here's 4% that still are having problems. We go back to box one. This time, though, the difference is when we get to box one, one kid at a time. So I want to know for Jimmy, when does Jimmy have problems? I'm coming to your school tomorrow, and I'm only going to be there for five minutes. If I see Jimmy have a problem, you get $1,000. What would you say? You'd say, well, either you need to be here at 10.06, or let me know when you're coming, and I'll make sure that we're doing math in a group setting, and I'm asking lots of questions, and we're asking kids to do it orally, because that's when it happens. It's the same set of questions we've been asking about your whole school and about small groups. The difference is we've switched to one kid. Now, at that point, we start calling it FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment. But it's the same logic we've been using. I'm going to suggest at that third time through, that doesn't mean we're necessarily in the red zone. It just means we've got to look at this kid like an individual. And again, whether we say they're in the red, yellow, green, whatever, really doesn't matter. That's just kind of a, a model we use for thinking about it. There's no purpose in labeling whether someone's at one level or another. It's just simply, now that that kid needs something individual, what's the simplest thing we could possibly do for that one kid? And if that doesn't work, we'll go back through this again. 
And what we end up doing will be more complicated. And if that doesn't work, we'll go through this again. And what we end up doing in box one, at some point, is going to be following this kid around coding everything they do. And what we're going to do at some point in box one is say, man, we couldn't figure that out. We need to get a doctor in here. And we, maybe we need a, a therapist of some sort. And maybe we need a, a whatever. The more times you go through this, the more people will be involved, the more time will be involved, and the more effort will be involved in boxes one, two, and three. Which means we'd really like to make this work simple the first time through. So let's find kids that need it and do the simplest thing first and see who it works for. And the ones that doesn't, then we'll do something bigger. Are there kids that are going to need full-blown, formal, time-consuming FBA? Yes, there are. I'm glad we have that. But let's save it for the kids that need it. Let's do the simplest things first. So here's, I think, the problem with FBA. <clears throat> This is the way I was taught to do an FBA, and uh, this is still the way I think of an FBA. The problem is, if you go into a school, and you're in the faculty room, and a teacher says to you, I'm really having problems with Jimmy. I've tried a lot of things, and nothing works. And you say to them, have you determined stimulus control and operant function? <laughs> They're going to stop talking to you. We have to be able to take this logic and make it sound like the thing real people talk about. So although this is real, we aren't going to be able to talk about it like that, and we're going to have to do some things that are simpler. First thing in order to simplify FBA is, let's simplify that wording. Nobody wants to hear about stimulus control. I, I would say start with getting rid of the word function. Function sounds like math. And I don't know anybody who likes math. So let's just get rid of function. Now, I know there are people that say they like math, but they don't. Nobody does. <laughs> I would use these kinds of words. How, why would that kid want to do that? What's in it for them? How is that helping them meet their needs? What's the purpose for the kid? Now, what I found is if you ask this question correctly, it's hard for people to answer it with non-functional answers. This is a non-functional answer. His parents are crazy. <laughs> and if I say, what's the function, I often get, he didn't take his meds, or his parents are crazy. But if I say, why would that kid want to do this? What's in it for him? Then his parents are crazy, and he didn't take his meds don't make sense for an answer. So if we want people to answer us in a functional way, we have to start talking to them in a way that makes sense. So I think we have to think about that. Second, I think we have to simplify our rationale. The rationale for doing an FBA isn't because it's a legal requirement under some circumstances. It's not because we have to. It's simply because an FBA will give us the information we need to make our intervention plan as simple and highly probably effective than anything else we can do. That's why we're doing it. It will make our lives simpler. We're also going to have to simplify the procedures. What is it that we expect people to do when we say FBA? So we're going to have to think back to what's it look like to do an FBA? What are the steps? What's the process? And I want it to be this simple. Anybody who works in a school can do an FBA. But we won't ask them to do it by themselves. We'll get a group of people together who know the kid we're thinking about and we'll ask them to do those four boxes. When should I come look if I wanted to see this kid have a problem? If you wanted to make that problem happen in the next 10 minutes, what would you do in that class? Those are questions that are, what are the antecedents? Why would that kid want to do that? What's in it for them? Those are questions about consequences. Now, what you could say if you wanted to be obtuse is, what's the stimulus control? That's the same question as, under what conditions do you think this will happen? So we need to get rid of the way people don't talk and change to the way people do talk. And instead of saying, what's the operant function, we should say, what's in it for them? Why would they want to do this? How is that helping them meet their needs? Those are the things people will understand. Now we can have a discussion and do an FBA while we're doing it. So 
I want to talk just for a second about the logic of what function means or purpose or why they're doing that or any of those things. First of all, we need to make sure that everybody understands people behave for a million reasons of which most of them will never understand or care. If Jimmy comes in and stands on your desk and you say, Jimmy, get off my desk. And then Jimmy says, oh, sorry. And you say, Jimmy, why were you on my desk? And Jimmy says, I don't know. Should we just stop FBA right here and assume he's insane and he needs to go to a mental hospital? He doesn't know why he was on my desk. Well, kids will answer, I don't know. That doesn't mean they don't know, although they might not know. Either way, if you say this, well, don't, and he never does it again, this does not require an FBA. <laughs> things that happen once aren't things that are FBA things. And I know the law says guns, drugs, etc. put them away for 45 days while you do an FBA. Honestly, I have no idea what that would look like. But we'll just ignore that part of the law and come back to what are the possibilities why was Jimmy standing on my desk? Well, I think these are the possibilities. These are what people will say. It was modeling. He saw other people standing on my desk. Thought he was supposed to. Or it was an accident. He was running through the room really fast and somehow ended up on my desk. It was totally an accident. Or it was instinctual for him. In his family, you always want to be at the highest point in a room. That's the way they work. And then if none of those make sense, you've always got con condition. So why would he be on your desk? Must have ADHD. How do you know? Standing on a desk. <laughs> so all of those could account for why it happened once. None of those would account for why it keeps happening. And honestly, we will probably never know which one of those made it happen once. We're interested in the ones that are happening over and over again. So why does Jimmy keep standing on your desk? Because it works. The purpose of an FBA is to figure out the answer to that question. How does it work? What's in it for him? Why would he want to do this? Those are the questions that an FBA answers. So that's where we want to be with this, because it works. Now let me take you back a second to ADHD. Isn't it possible that kid does have ADHD? I mean, standing on a desk doesn't prove it, but what if he does? Two things I think are really important to think about when we think about ADHD or any other mental label that comes out of the DSM. One, even kids with ADHD operate functionally. They operate on their environment to get things they want. They might be less able to keep themselves from doing things because of impulse control, but they still do it for a reason. And all the best research we have says the highest probability treatment for kids with ADHD is a low dose of psychostimulant medication and behavior modification, which is functional. So it doesn't matter if it's ADHD. We still need to be doing this. Second, the only way you can prove that something is truly a mental disorder is to prove that it can't be explained just by the environment. That's the exclusion criteria in all of those things. Childhood depression, uh, bipolar, ADHD, all of those can't be explained simply by things happening in the environment. I would like to think of an FBA as trying to prove that the environment is or isn't involved. If FBA says, man, this thing has no rhyme or reason to it, then we probably are talking about something where we need a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. However, the number of kids for whom that's the case is really very small. Therefore, it makes more sense for us to say, what's the simplest thing we could do to see if it would work for that kid? If we exhaust all of our good stuff behaviorally, then we've got the evidence we need to say, we need to take this up a notch and go somewhere else. But technically, you shouldn't be able to say a kid's ADHD simply because they stood on a desk several times. 
you'd need to demonstrate there wasn't something else. So either way, we're going to need to go down this road. Here's how simple I think FBA is. This is a teacher telling us that the class was quietly doing its lesson when Russell, suffering from problems at home, prepared to employ an attention-getting device. What's the function here? The teacher's telling us what she thinks it is. Now, I show this sometimes when I have people say, it's suffering from problems at home. Then we're asking the wrong question. What's the function? Oh, suffering from problems at home. Let me ask the question differently. What's Russell getting out of this? Why would he want to do this? What's in it for him? Now you can't answer problems at home because that doesn't make any sense. What's he getting out of this? Problems at home, that doesn't make any sense. Attention. If you ask the question correctly, it becomes really simple. And I think most people think functionally, but they're not used to using the function. They'll say that and then go back to the problems at home part, which again, may be true, but it doesn't answer one of the questions that we had. So what we want to do is think about how to make this way simpler. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this with a group of people that know the kid. We are not going to go out and collect data from this point forward. We're going to start with collecting data from this point backward. So this is this, at one point in my career, my job was to go to schools and do observations, FBAs of kids. So what would typically happen is I'd get a, a call from whoever, and they'd say, you need to go to this school tomorrow, and you're seeing this kid. And so I'd go to that school, walk in the door, go to the office, and say, I'm here to see Jimmy. And they go, yeah, third door on the left, Mrs. Jones. So I go down the door. I open that door and walk in, and every kid in the classroom is staring at me. And immediately the teacher says, don't pay attention to him, which makes everybody go, why shouldn't we pay attention to him? This must be exciting. And she says, no, he's, he's, he's not here to look at anybody. <laughs> you know? And then somehow that teacher's got to signal me where Jimmy is. So he goes, everybody get to work. Jimmy knows exactly why I'm there. In fact, Jimmy a lot of times is turning around waving at me. You're watching me, aren't you? And I'm, no, who are you? Why would I be watching you? And what does Jimmy do on the day when I'm there watching? He is the most angelic student ever. Okay. May I help my peers with their homework, please? Right? And he's holding doors and holding chairs. And I'm there for hours. And then they say to me, what'd you see? And I say, Nothing. And they go, what? You didn't see when other kids come over and say this? He does this? And then I'm thinking, if you already know all the things that happen, why am I here to tell you? That seems like a really dumb way to do it. A smarter way would be to get all the people that know that kid together and ask those questions. If I said I was coming and wanted to see it, what would you have going on in your room? What's that behavior look like? What else is going on? When he does that, what happens? What do you think is in it for him? Those are the questions I want to ask of the people who see this kid every day. But if I ask the right questions, I can get the right answers. Well, what we found was when we started doing that with some schools, and we originally did this with a group of about five schools in Gainesville, Florida. And so we set up these FBA teams based not on who knew FBA, but based upon who knew the kid we were talking about. And so I would go in and I'd get it started by saying, What's this kid's problem? What's the behavior? And these were the kinds of things I'd hear. That kid's a jerk. That kid's lazy. That kid's an idiot. These aren't behaviors. Those are personalities. Okay. We're asking the wrong questions. So what we've got to do is we've got to figure out how to get a group of people that don't know what FBA is and don't really care to talk about FBA without knowing it. That means asking the right questions in the right way. So we need to know when and where, we need to know why, and we want to know because the information we get out of this will make the intervention plan as simple as it can be. So this is what we started doing in those schools in Gainesville. 
we gave every teacher in those schools a bookmark that looked like this. So everybody gets that on the first day. We came in and we did this little 10, 15 minute overview with all the faculty and staff on the first day. And I'd say something like this. This year, instead of doing our behavior support teams the way we did last year, we're going to have, instead of having one team, we're going to have different teams. But we're not going to set the teams up yet. The teams will be set up once we identify a kid that needs it. And anybody in here could end up being on one of those teams. Now, you might be saying, I'm the PE teacher. What do I know about behavior? Why would you put me on the behavior team? My answer is, you'll be on a team if you know the kid we're talking about. Because we want to know what you know about that kid. So if you're invited to a behavior meeting, you can call it whatever you want, an FBA meeting, a BIP meeting, a BSP meeting, or whatever, you need to come ready to answer four or five questions. Here's the way I want you to think about these questions. Question one, I want you, when you sit down at that table, to give me a description of behavior that is so concrete that when you get done saying it, I will stand up and I will act it out and it will look and sound exactly like that kid. So lazy, that's not going to be good enough. I'm going to need, puts his head down on his desk, buries his face in his arms, and doesn't look up for 20 minutes at a time. Okay, you might call that lazy. I don't know what lazy is. I know what putting your head on your desk and keeping it is. Course. Number two, make the assumption, I'm, and we're forcing you to do this. You don't have a choice. Make the assumption that they're doing it for a reason. Now, I don't mean they're sitting there thinking, I'm going to do this, I don't care what. But just make the assumption that if they were doing this for a reason, what would that be? Are they getting something? Are they avoiding something? Why would they want to do this? Now, some people will say, I don't think they do want to. You just put, put your hand right in their face and say, but what if they were? What's your best guess? That's all we want is the best guess right now. Number three, we'd like to know what would you like this kid to do under those circumstances? And if they did that, would they get the same thing they get from doing the wrong thing? That's what we're looking for. Number four, if I told you I'd give you $10,000 if they did that thing you want them to do, tomorrow, what would you do? And that's number four there is instruction. It involves what are you going to teach? How are you going to teach it? Where will you say it? When will you say it? Will it be in big groups, small groups? Will it be one-on-one? -on -one? How many questions will you ask them and expect them to answer back? What kinds of feedback will you give them during that discussion? Will you stand over here or over there? Will they be at their desk? You get to make every decision under number four. What would you do if you thought, I'd get extra money tomorrow if this worked? And number five, if we meet back here in a month and say, is this working or not, we need to come up with an agreeable number kind of thing that we could say. We can't come back here and go, yeah, it was OK. I need to know, it was six, it's now five. What is a simple way for us to all say we're going to measure that for that student? So this is what we started doing. We started creating these little teams. And this is a pretend team. These are all neither teachers nor really actors either. So um, there are six people who were, were willing and able to sit in for this. So what we've got here are a teacher who referred a kid because of problems, a PE teacher who doesn't know the, or doesn't really know anything about behavior and says so, but knows the kid, the principal who knows the kid, a parent a librarian, and I'm playing the role of a counselor. And what we've said, what we found out as we did these things repeatedly was you need to have two things to make them work efficiently. One is a protocol, a checklist, a step-by-step -step thing, an agenda, something to keep us on task. Because the number one problem we found when we put these teams together and tried to let them go 
is they would talk for an hour and never have answered any of the five questions we wanted them to talk about. They talked a lot about the kids' parents. They talked a lot about vacations. They talked a lot about, but nothing about this. So we said, there needs to be an agenda that says, question one is this, question two is this, and when we get done with the questions, we get to leave. Two, there needs to be one person whose job it is to keep people on task. What we found is if you can have one person on that team that kind of gets what it is we're doing and whose job it is to keep people on task, we can do an FBA in about a half an hour. You get people in there, you talk about it, you say why, you say what should we do, we build a plan. Now the planning part is the second part. We fairly regularly now, using a form and a person who gets it, with a group of people who know the kid, do the assessment and write an intervention plan in about an hour. Now, if you've got a really complicated kid, then this isn't going to be enough. In fact, your team might decide right then and there at the meeting, man, this is we have no idea what's going on with this, in which case you wouldn't just say, well, throw an intervention in there and see what happens. You'd say, then I think we need to collect more information. And what's happened is you've just shifted up a little bit higher on the triangle. But what you got to do is say, at what level are we asking the least we think we could and still be successful with this kid? So this is the form we use. It's called the Intervention and Assessment Record. Um, myself and two of my colleagues, Mike Nelson and Carl Leopson, uh, messed around with this a bunch and have it in the format that it is now. It starts with who's the kid and who are we, and then it goes into what are we going to do? Start with question one from E-Race, which is, what's the problem? Why are we here? What's going on with this kid? So I'm going to show you a video of this team discussing this. And let me give you a couple of pre-corrections on the videos. Number one, they're made up. There's no such kid as Eric that we're talking about in here. Number two, the people in here aren't good actors, so don't try to focus on acting abilities. Number three, I have written these purposefully for people to ask questions and say things that I have heard people say. So they're going to say a lot of obnoxious things. I don't believe there are that many obnoxious things in one team. I just wanted to make sure that you heard what people say. So for instance, you're going to hear right off the principal saying something about well, this isn't for us, this should go to a medical doctor. And the response is, from me who's leading the team, you're right, this could be a medical issue, but first let's figure out if there's a simpler explanation and just keep it going. Don't let people sidetrack it off of the things we're doing. So, this is what it might look like the first time they ever met. So to start with, Ms. Smith, can you tell us more about the problems you're seeing? Uh, what kind of noises? How long has it been going on? Anything else you can do to help us? Well, Eric is a good kid, and I do really enjoy having him in my classroom. But for the last few weeks, his noises have been just out of control. It seems like every five minutes I'm dealing with his noises and ignoring the rest of my clients and what I'm doing. So what are we talking about here? Give me an example of what you mean by noises. We've got a million of them. He hums, he drums, taps, honks, squeaks, you name it. That sounds like Tourette syndrome. Maybe we should just refer this case to a medical doctor. <laughs> well, you're right, we certainly can't rule out Tourette's at this point. But I think if we look at the forms, what we're supposed to be doing is just trying to figure out if maybe there's a simpler explanation. And then if there's not, we can always refer them on to more assessment after that. Well, I know Eric pretty well, but I've never done any kind of assessment on him. So I don't know how I can really help you. Well, really all we're supposed to be doing, if you look at page two, is just figure out what kinds of things happen right before and right after he has a problem, what kinds of things happen right before and right after when he's not having problems, and then put it together and see if we can figure out why he's having these problems and what we can do to help. Okay, then when are these noises most likely to occur? Exactly. That's what we need to figure out. So um, is it a student? Is it a particular subject? What kinds of things tend to happen right before he has his problems? Well, I've never really seen his behavior at home. In the classroom, he has just as much trouble doing math or reading as he does at any other time. 
but the other children just going about their business. Well, in PE, we stay pretty active, so I wouldn't necessarily notice any noises. But I can't say that Eric looks any different from any other kid that I have. I mean, he does yell out to me when he needs something, but I don't see it as a problem. I mean, I don't know that this is kind of what you're seeing. Well, if I'm looking right at him, or we aren't in a quiet work time, then I don't see them either. But just this morning, I can think of three examples of when I had to get after him for noises. Okay, so we had to go through a couple of roadblocks, a couple of bumps there, but we kept the train moving down the track of, why are we here, what are we looking for? We got a lot of good information out of that. Finally, we got, he makes a lot of noises, and they're disruptive. He has a whole repertoire of noises, they're all disruptive. We also know that if she's looking right at him, it doesn't seem to be a problem. If they're in a group discussion, it doesn't seem to be a problem. It's mainly quiet work time, she said, and she said the other kids kind of ignore it. So in two minutes of talking, we've gotten a lot of FBA information. Now what she said at the very end there is, I could give you three examples just from this morning. That's what we want to know. Great. Tell us what you saw this morning. Because what's going to happen is, I'm going to, as the person leading this, I'm going to think about what she's saying in terms of what happened before the behavior happened, which is the A antecedent column on the far left. What's the kid doing? And what happens afterward, the consequence? So I could take a form like this and follow this kid around for a month, or I could ask people what they've seen and I could fill it out post hoc. Again, talking about a pretty simple case here. So here are the three examples that she tells us about. As she's telling this, I want you to think, what was going on? What was the context? What happened right before he had the problem? What did he do? And what was the outcome? What, what was the result? What's in it for him? What happens after he does this? I'm going to show you three examples. These are, this is a fairly simple set here. You need to sit here quietly and do your work. What time do I have to speech today? Not until 2.30. Here's number two. Okay, so we can agree, after those three stories, that he does, in fact, make noises. Okay, so that part was easy. The harder question is number two, which is, why would he want to make noises? When is it predictable that he'll do this, and what's in it for him? If I said to you, I'm coming to your class tomorrow, and Eric's going to be in your class. If I see him making a noise, you get $1,000. I can only be there for five minutes. What would you set up? What would you want to be going on? The answer to those are the predictors, the A column. So what we want to do is this team will just continue to talk about that. What's going on? What have we seen? How do we put this together? I've seen some of the same kind of behavior in the library. A couple of times, he'd just yell across the room if he needed something. I talked to him about this. It's not been a frequent problem, but it sounds similar to what you described. So how did you respond right after he did that? I went to him immediately and asked him to stay quiet. What did he want? I don't remember exactly. Probably to ask a question on finding a book or when the new Sports Illustrated for Kids would come out. He's really big on that. Did you answer the question? Well, again, I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure I did. Okay. Let's move on now and talk about times when he's not making noises. I mean, are there times when he's engaging in appropriate behavior and not making noises? Oh, yes. When I have class discussions, I always call only on those students who are raising their hands. And he has no problem raising his hands without making noise. 
and I do call on him. And when I do call on him, he engages in the discussion quite appropriately. Yeah, he really doesn't yell most of the time. We do a lot of cooperative work groups, and he works appropriately and without noises or yelling. This group always finishes the assignment and earns free reading time. Good. We're getting a lot of really good information here. I, I'm, I'm putting it down. I think we've covered what's happening before and after he makes uh, the noises. I think we've covered what happens before and after he engages in appropriate behavior. Now I think we need to put it on, the, on this ABC form and see if we can figure out if there are any predictable patterns that we can look at. So then I show this to them. I've been writing down what they've been saying. So now what I want to do is, instead of sorting through hours of contents, many, much of which is irrelevant, I can go right to what were the problems. That middle column there has four problems that were described. The column on the left describes things that were going on during that, when that happened. So what we can ask is, what's in common across those things? The column on the right says, here's what typically happens afterwards. So we can look at that and say, what's in it for this kid? Why would he want to do that? What's going on here? The answer to that, and the bottom part is, I also want to know, does he ever do it right? If he never does it right, that's going to say we need to teach him how, very likely. If he can do it right, then it's not necessarily a how, but a when and why that we'd have to teach. And down here it says he can raise his hand. He does it when he's in a class discussion. So we know he's got that. So now what we want to do is put those three things together to come up with a function. Okay, and finally, we heard that when the assistant was looking at the board, Eric was making noises, thumping on his desk, and then she goes over and, and responds to him. He asks if he's a rescue man. She lets him go. So if we look at all this stuff together now, what kinds of patterns are we seeing? And looking back at what I said, you know, it seems like he makes noises more often when I'm not looking at him. And that's what Mr. Jones sees in the library, too. Why would he only make noises when people weren't looking at him? I mean, I know they can hear him regardless of whether they can see him, so that doesn't make sense. Well, maybe it does make sense if he wants the teachers to look at him. In fact, if you look at the times when he did raise his hand and talk in an appropriate voice, it's when he had the attention of teacher and peer. And the outcome of noise making has always been immediate attention. That really does hold true across all our examples. Can anyone think of an example where he's making noises when he already had your attention? Well, I couldn't say it's never happened, but in general, it seems to happen only when I'm not looking at him. I don't know. If he's a kid with decent social skills, plenty of peer friendships, and does well in school, why would he crave attention so much? Well, if you look at the form, it looks like it's not just simple attention. He gets questions answered, requests granted, and even help with his work. I agree, he makes noises to get attention. Although it's the same for all kids in PE, just because that's where my class is from. Then it sounds to me like what we're saying is that Eric makes noises whenever he's not getting attention from other people. And that when he makes those noises, he gets attention from other people who meet his needs. So the function of his behavior is to get adult attention. Does that sound like a reasonable statement of the function of Eric's behavior to all of you? Okay, then I'm going to note that on the form, and I think we're ready to move on for interventions. Now, obviously, <clears throat> because I write the scripts, I can make these end any way I want. And I don't necessarily believe that you're really going to do a full FBA in seven minutes like we just did. There is going to be a lot more stuff said, and a lot more discussion, and a lot more. And so in reality, this is going to take longer than that. But the set of steps and the simplicity with which we work through them will be exactly the same. This is our logic. That top row of boxes, the, the ones connected by green, that's an FBA. We want to know generally under what conditions we should be looking for this. We want to know what's the thing that tends to happen right before it. We want to know what's the kid doing. And we want to know why. What's in it for them? Why would they want to do this? If you can fill in that top row of boxes, you've done an FBA. Now, when we do the intervention plan, it's what do you want them to do instead of the problem behavior, but it's so much more than that. It's how do we get them to do what we want them to do instead, and what will we do if they do and don't? 
but we start off by just trying to fill in that set of boxes. So if you think about that for Eric, if I told you I'm coming to your school tomorrow, Eric's in your classroom, I want to see Eric have this problem. Would you have me come and watch during group discussion time? No, we heard that was not a good time to see it. Would you have me watch during PE? No, because she said everybody yells out in PE so it wouldn't look like anything. What time would you have me come? Right, quiet, independent seat work. That's what we saw over and over again as the antecedent. And during the time when we were having independent seat work, what seems to be a thing that would really predict this? Right, the teacher looking somewhere else. So that's what we heard them say. That's what we saw repeatedly. It was quiet, independent work time. I was at the board. I was with another kid. I was on the other side of the room. And he made a noise and came over. Librarian said essentially the same thing. So here's what we've got. Given that it's independent work time, and the teacher isn't readily available to Eric, Eric will make disruptive noises. And when he makes disruptive noises, the teacher will ask him what he needs and then grant his request. So it's not just simple attention like, hey, Eric, how's it going? Why don't I sit here and chat? But he gets requests granted, et cetera. But it's still, he gets the teacher. So why would Eric continue to make noises? It works. The answer to how does it work is he gets the teacher to come over and grant his requests. Now here's the problem. That was pretty simple. That was pretty obvious. Most of you had that without doing any kind of this stuff. So then we say this, what do you want Eric to do? And most of us would say, well, what do the successful kids in your class do when they need your attention? They raise their hand. Well, then tell Eric to raise his hand tomorrow. And then what the teacher's going to say to you? I've told him that 7,000 times over the last two months. He's, he already knows that. We say, yeah, but if he raises his hand, he'll get attention. I'm Tell him it again, except this time, take him aside and say it really slowly to him. <laughs> so I take Eric aside and I say, during independent work time, when you're at your desk and I am not really looking at you, raise your hand and I'll come over. And this is what Eric will say. No, thank you. I have this noise-making thing I do that works really fast every time. <laughs> and he's right. Why would Eric do this and wait for me to look at him when he can do this, yoo-hoo, and I'll look at him immediately every time? I mean, simply, he's, we're giving him two options to get the exact same thing. He's going to take the simplest one, which he should. That's the way all of us operate. He should do the simplest thing he needs to do to get what he wants. It's not enough just to know why. Now the trick is to figure out how to change this. Now, that line between problem behavior and access of OI reinforce, or problem behavior and function, that is the function line. We have to get rid of that. The way to get rid of that line is with punishment. What we have to ask is, what's the most efficient and effective and simple punishment we could use on that line? So let's go to a big one. We are going to slap you across the head with a two by four. <laughs> so Eric says, why would I raise my hand when I can make a noise? And we go, because when you make a noise, you're going to get this. <laughs> and he's going to go, oh, right, all right. Well, here's the thing, you did not need a functional assessment to do that. If you want to pull out your big sticks and your bags of money, you don't need an FBA. If you can have big enough consequences, it doesn't matter. What we want, though, is the simplest explanation. I know this, he wants teacher attention. So the simplest explanation, the simplest intervention on punishment would be, don't let him get teacher attention for doing it wrong. But we needed the FBA to know that. Because if we would have figured out, conversely, instead of the function being he wants teacher attention, he does it to make the teacher leave him alone. Then if you use as a punishment there, I'm going to ignore you, it's not a punishment. You're making it 
exactly what he wants. The purpose of the FBA will for, was for us to be able to figure out what we have to use there to make this work really simple. And again, you don't need an FBA if you've got $1,000 bills. You can make anything work, or a cattle prod. You can make anything work. The purpose of the FBA was to figure out what's the simplest thing. So here's what I'm going to say. You know, what, what happens is this is a habit for Eric now. He isn't sitting in my classroom going, gee, I wonder what I could do to get attention today. It just happens. He's flying down the freeway. This is not a pathway for him. It's a freeway. It's four lanes wide, and he's driving a Ferrari, and there's no speed limit. And he comes zooming in, and hey, look, I'm coming up onto independent work bill time. And look, right after independent work bill is teacher not looking at me town. I know when you get to teacher not looking at me town, you hang a left and go on up to Noiseville and you end up in reinforcement town every time. So then we say to him this, hey, uh, Eric, you know how you go down the road? And this is like you going to work every day. You don't stop at every intersection and go, which way should I turn today? You just go. That's what he does. So we come in and we say to him, you know the intersection right there at right after teacher not looking at me town? You've been hanging a left. What we want you to do is hang a right. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Hanging a left is great. It's a freeway the whole way. And I happen to know that hanging a right is a dirt road. And it's going to take me a long time. And we go, yeah, but what you don't know is the bridge between Noiseville and Teacher Attention Town has been blown up. It's gone. We used a little dynamite called ignoring, and we blew it up. What will Eric think? He will not believe you. Or he'll think, I'll bet I could rebuild it. <laughs> so he comes flying down the highway tomorrow, and you're standing at the intersection going, go right. And he flies right on by you up left, and he gets up there and starts making noises, and he finds out that you can't get across. The bridge is, in fact, out. So what does he do? He says, I'll bet I could jump this bridge. And he backs up his Ferrari, and he goes 200 miles an hour. And what's this look like for you in the classroom? <laughs> Louder noises, longer noises, more obnoxious noises. And if you keep ignoring, he'll start personalizing those noises for you and your family members. <laughs> and there's a point where you come running over there and say, what? Why don't you raise your hand? And he's going to say, I need to use the restroom. And you know what you did is you just rebuilt the bridge for him. And at the same time, you said to him, by the way, Eric, if in the future I ever say that bridge is out, just keep trying because eventually it'll come back. So what we have to decide going in is, what's the smallest amount of dynamite that's logical given what the function is and that would really work? Because sometimes the smallest thing, which might be ignoring, might not be effective or efficient or realistic. And if we're talking about somebody hitting somebody, for attention, ignoring can't ever be your intervention. It's not realistic. So what's the simplest kind of dynamite you could use? But you have to know what function is to know which ones are logical. So what we want to do now is figure out how to put this all into one package. This is where we ended up. We said the general antecedent is independent work time with no direct teacher attention. The problem behavior is disruptive noises, and the general consequence is teacher attention to grant his needs. So we could put those three things together, and that becomes a statement of function. Let's do another one. This one will be harder, and I'm going to make you do this one. This is Sarah. Let me tell you what I know about Sarah. Sarah's in ninth grade. Sarah has been here for about three months and has had a set of problem behaviors ever since she's been here. She has five classes during the day. They are math, language arts, geography, a lunch period, um, science, and study hall. So a lunch and five periods. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to show you what she's been doing. I'm going to tell you three stories that you'll see in video format. Here's what I want you to think about. 
I want you to think about this for Sarah. As you watch these three things, I want you to start thinking, don't worry about the bottom box, the top row. Under what conditions would I expect to see this happen from Sarah, given what you've told me? What seems to be the thing that makes this happen, given what you've told me? What is it that Sarah does? How could you describe it in such a way that I could act it out? And finally, why do you think Sarah's doing this? What's in it for her? Why would she want to? Now, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to show you just three simple pop, pop, pop like you saw for Eric. And you're going to have some ideas about this, but you're not going to know how big or little it could be. So you look at that first box and you could say, ah, maybe it's whenever Sarah's awake, this happens. <laughs> well, man, you know what? If that's true, your intervention is going to be really hard. Maybe you could say, whenever Sarah's around an adult, that's a lot better. Whenever Sarah's at school, that's way bigger. What you'd like to do is ask enough questions while you're sitting with that team to be able to make that as tight as it could be. Because if you made that thing say, whenever Sarah is in math class that happens in the morning and an adult asks her a question about geometry, this is what happens. Then, man, your intervention can be really tight. So we need to know how tight can we get it. Because if that same intervention is for that same kid and all you know is it happens sometimes at school, it's really hard to know what to do. Second, the trigger. What's the exact thing that we think makes this happen? Is it as big as being looked at or as small as being asked this kind of a thing or as what she do? And then what do you think she's getting out of it? Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the three examples. When I get done, I'm going to put the boxes back up. I'm going to ask you to be thinking, what do you think goes in the boxes? You'll, all you'll be able to do is narrow it from whenever the sun is out to somewhere in here. Then you're going to ask me questions. I'm going to be the teacher sitting here on this team, and I'm going to answer the questions. You're going to ask me the questions that would allow me to shrink that down and make it smaller. So you should be thinking, if I were sitting on that team, what would I ask? So here's what you know so far, these three examples. Sarah, would you please have a seat? I'm not doing any of this crap today. Then you won't get a grade for today. I want you to have a seat. I heard what you said. Students, open your books to page 257, please. Folks, I need you to turn in your homework. Sarah, did you do your homework? No, did you? If you didn't do it, then I'll need you to do it now. I need you to get away from me. Did you turn in your homework? Maybe you shouldn't touch your thing. Just kidding. Good job. Sarah, you might want to check your answers. I don't need your help. Go away. Well, it looks like you might need to check those because two of them are not correct. Well, it looks to me like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. So, how big or how small is your setting condition here? Is it whenever Sarah's at school? Is it whenever Sarah's in a class? Is it whenever Sarah's spoken to by a female? Is it, now here's the deal. I'm going to be the teacher and I'm going to answer as the teacher. I'll tell you what I do know and if I don't know it, I'm going to just say I don't know. Here's what you should be thinking. What's the fewest number of questions you could ask to drill those down really tight? In order to do that, you have to think about what are good questions for FBA. There are a million questions you could ask that have importance in other things. We have one goal here, to figure out what goes across that pathway. So a question like this, how many siblings does she have? Good question, 
but it doesn't help us to fill in any of these boxes. Yes, I will answer for any teacher on the team. Yes, I'll answer, you can ask me and I can answer for any teacher that she has. So what you want to do is think out, how can I, in the fewest questions possible, shrink that down? Now again, answering, asking me a question like, um, are her parents married? I'm going to answer, I don't know. Now that doesn't mean that there's no way that's important. What it means is, that's not what an FBA is about. If, if the simplest level of FBA is, what could we as adults who work in that school change in the school to make that kid more successful? If the answer is, it's bigger than this, then we're going to have to get bigger. So I'm not saying that all kinds of questions about family and all that stuff aren't important. What I'm saying is, they aren't what we're asking about when we do an FBA at the simplest level. So I will just answer I don't know to questions that don't fill in this. So I will be the teacher, and I can also answer for the other teachers. There are five of us teachers here. And I'm going to let this go for like five or ten minutes at the most. And when we get done doing this, you should be able to tell me exactly what goes in that top row of boxes. So. She has five classes. This behavior occurs in four of them. It does not occur in study hall at the end of the day. Is she struggling academically? She's not doing well in her classes, but it's not because she's not capable. It's because she just doesn't do any of the work. I think she's just lazy. She does have friends. She doesn't seem to have any peer problems with anybody ever. And, she, and in every class, she has some friends that they just seem to kind of ignore her during this. Does she engage in power struggles with positive attention? Um, I don't know exactly what you mean, but she doesn't get a lot of positive attention because she doesn't ever do what I ask her to do. Oh, no. She, I mean, she's sarcastic if I ask her to do something that's academic related. If I said, hey, would you carry this stuff to the office for me? Would you help me move this table? Would you erase the chalkboard? She'd do it, no problem. But if I say do something like join us, fix that, anything that's academic related, forget it. It's going to be that kind of stuff. Yeah, any time it's any academics of any type. Yeah, I have 30 kids to teach math to. I can't go talking individually to kids. <laughs> What's her attendance like? Uh, She's here every day. <laughs> I, I don't know why. <laughs> what does she get out of? What does she get out of the behavior? Well, she doesn't do any work. I mean, yeah, I agree. She 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 does nothing. And when I say do something, she's rude. And then there's what? What can I do? I mean, when she first came here, I said do something, and she got rude with me. And I said. That will not fly in here. You do not talk to me that way. And she'd just get ruder. I'd send her to the office, and she started going to the office every day. She would just do it immediately when she came in. And then the principal and counselor came to me and said, you need to st stop sending her down here. So <laughs> here's the consequence she gets now. We've got this set up in all her classes. You come in, you do what you're told. If you don't do what you're told, you automatically are getting an F. So. That's the consequence. No, this is, it's a math class. This isn't free time. There are no choices. We have a math curriculum. She needs to do it. What? Yeah. 
she does. And I time out here a second. I know you could ask me a whole bunch of questions about how do I know that she does. Just assume that she does. <laughs> yes. There are no. You, it's essentially it's, it's they do nothing. But the, the the idea was you go to study hall and if you have outstanding work you can work on it there and catch up. And because she has a lot of outstanding work, they gave her study hall. However, the study hall teacher, they're on the honor system, and she always says she has nothing to do, so. Now, even in a group, if it had academics with it, no, she wouldn't do it. Well, I've got kids that are doing all of their work. And you want me to go by and say, goody, goody for you, Sarah, You're, you did something? <laughs> I'm also uneasy about the fact that this is turning to be about me. I thought this to be about this kid. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Ever since she's been here. <laughs> she always gets out because there's nothing else I can do other than say you're getting an F for the day. And if she doesn't want to get an F, she can get to work. But she doesn't. Would you have her do that if she was in your class? Because if so, I think we've got a solution for this whole problem. We just move her to you. <laughs> we don't have a pretest. She's just in ninth grade math. Again, let's just assume she's capable, but failing because she's not doing anything. And she's not over capable or under. She's. Just... We think so. I mean, we've, we've got some documentation that says it was basically the same thing. So I don't think it's unique to us. Okay, think about how narrow it could. You, where are you right now on this? Do you think you could get it narrower? You know, it's not like she's absolutely never done any work. She has, but I couldn't say that there was anything that I could point to that was going on different on the times when she has done work. I, she just likes free time. No, she doesn't. If I praise other kids, she doesn't respond to that at all. And I don't really get to praise her because she never does anything right. Yeah, I don't. I would support her going to the counselor. In fact, I would release her from math every day to go to the counselor because I think some one on one would be really good. Do I ever say hi or anything positive to her? I'm sure that I do. I don't, you know, think about it, but I'm sure I say hi to her. If, if you're asking, are we close? No. <laughs> she reads, she stares at the wall, she plays with things. I mean, there's, it's not predictable what, it's just the not doing other things. Okay. Two more questions. They ignore it. Good 
question. Does she ask the, act the same toward female and male? Uh, yeah. Mr. Jones runs the study hall, but the rest of the courses are male and female. Doesn't make a difference. Here are other things that don't make a difference. Morning or afternoon classes, doesn't make a difference. Um, day of the week, doesn't make a difference. We, there doesn't seem to be any pattern other than where we're going to end up. No problems if there's not an academic component to it. So, tomorrow I'm coming to your school to see Sarah. I want to see this problem. I should show up and go where? <laughs> to any academic class. We can narrow it all the way down to any academic class. Okay, there's four of them. Study hall doesn't count. It's not an academic related. So, now, trigger. During that academic class, what's the thing that's likely to make this happen? Is it an adult talks to her? Yes. Is it an adult asks her to do something? <laughs> an adult asks her to do something related to academics. We can narrow it way down there. Now we can say, what does she do? And what do you think she's getting out of it? Now, as you can see, She's getting away from having to do work. She does this when work is presented. Hey, do work. No. Okay, don't then. That's kind of where it is. <laughs> Why would she not do this? It works. Now, here would be the problem with our intervention for Sarah if you think about it the same way we've been thinking about intervention for Eric. I go to Sarah and I say, guess what, Sarah? I've got a new deal for you. If you can get three problems done, I'll give you 15 minutes of free time. Here's what she's going to say. I've got a better idea. I'll do no problems and have free time the entire day. <laughs> she's right. Whenever the, op the, whenever the function is to escape, it's going to be more tricky for us because we can't just say, oh, you want that thing? We control it. She controls it right now, and it's controlling doing nothing is going to be really hard for us. So what we're going to have to do when we build this intervention for Sarah is we're going to have to build that intervention real heavy at the front end, which means after we get our FBA, we're going to think, what do you want her to do? Okay, I want her to do some work. Right now, how much work is she doing? Zero. So, I'm going to ask her to do some work to get some free time. And she's going to say, I've already got free time. Why would I do something for it? And we're going to have to blow up that bridge. So here's what we're going to have to think about for her. Where does Sarah get free time during the day? So she gets, she's taking basically free time through every class. Then she goes to lunch, free time. Then she comes back to class, then she goes to study hall. She gets free time all day. So we go to Sarah and we say this. Sarah, we love the fact that you get free time. We love the fact that you get a chance to hang out and talk with your friends. Like lunch, for instance. Awesome for you to have that whole time. And study hall, awesome for you to have that. You've been taking a lot of free time in class, but you're just sitting there. Here's the deal. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to think three steps ahead on a power struggle. Because if I have to implement this spur of the moment, I'm going to say do it. She's going to say no. I'm going to say yes, you will. She's going to say no, I won't. And this escalates really ugly really fast. So I just say, here are the three steps. One, you come to class. We've got this many problems set up for you to do. If you get those problems done, you get super free time for the rest of the time, which involves the computer or whatever else is there. Now, you have to do math-related activities on it, but you get the computer. If you choose not to do those things, or if you don't get them done, you don't get that computer time, but the thing, same thing would go for the next class. If you refuse to even try these, then we've rearranged it so you can be back here during lunch and do them. Now, that would be a shame to lose that free time for lunch. If you do this, this simple set of problems, you get super free time, and lunch free time. If you choose not to come here at lunch, or you come here and refuse to work, 
then we'd have to have you back here again during your study hall time. And you don't want that. Now, what Sarah's got to be thinking is, if I like free time, doing it their way actually gets me more free time than doing it my way. And that's all we're trying to set up with these. But I have to know what the function was in order to know how to play with this. Because if I'm thinking of this the same way I did for Eric and saying, oh, well, if you get five problems done, I'll come over and sit and talk with you for a while. That will make her for sure not do any of the work. I have to know why she was doing the problem in order to know how to fix it. Now, again, with a bag of money and a big stick, I could do this anyway. But what we want to do is we want to use what we know about what's going on in the environment and why it happened to develop the plan that's the simplest for us and the most likely logical and effective for them. So we end up here with we're going to teach them what we want them to do. We're going to create environments that set them up to be successful. We're going to give them lots of reminders. We're going to talk about how we arrange the, the desks. We're going to talk about where I should stand, what time of day it should happen. We're going to ask how can we make sure she gets free time and gets good free time for doing it the right way? And how can we make sure that she doesn't get free time? Why is it that we're messing with free time? Because that was what we determined was the function when we did our FBA. So that's what we're trying to play with. So in sum, that's the simplicity we're trying to, to build with schools. FBA is a formal, technological, validated piece of uh, technology, I guess, for us. But if we're going to use it simple, we're going to have to think about it in a different way. This in no 